We recognize encryption is an essential cybersecurity tool in the hands of the right people. But like any tool, it can be abused. The Fourth Amendment establishes that under certain circumstances, the public has a legitimate need to gain access to an individual's zone of privacy in pursuit of public safety. In June last year, the Lawful Access to Encrypted Data Act was introduced in the U.S. Senate. Once enforced, the bill would require tech companies to provide access to their encrypted communication service upon request from law enforcement. According to the bill's proponents, unregulated encryption enables crimes such as drug trafficking, child abuse, and terrorism to go undetected. Some companies want to say to the individual, hey, we can make you invisible to law enforcement. But do we want to live in a society where everyone is invisible to law enforcement? Still, privacy advocates consider strong encryption a necessary tool to safeguard people's privacy and freedom. Allowing governments to bypass encryption, they say, represents a threat to those fundamental values. We have a right to have a confidential conversation between the two of us that has nobody else listening into it, in which we have confidence that nobody else is listening into it. If you have these rights, you have to assert them, otherwise you will um, lose. All right, all right. Welcome everyone to another Cointelegraph live stream. I'm Giovanni here, and uh, this time we're going to talk about the latest Cointelegraph documentary about the history of cryptography. Uh, if you haven't watched the documentary yet, uh, I strongly recommend you to check it on our YouTube channel. Today, I have the pleasure to be joined by two of the main protagonists of the documentary, Scott Stornetta, the co-inventor of blockchain technology, and Nigel Smart, professor of cryptography. Welcome, guys. Hiya. How's it going? Pleasure to be here. Awesome. Awesome to have you guys. Thanks for joining. Um, so as uh, the audience probably already watched, already saw in, uh, in our intro, uh, the documentary that we just uh, released is about the history of cryptographic technology, which is, of course, the technology uh, at the base of cryptocurrency, and uh, uh, how this technology, in, in, in its evolution, in, in its historical evolution, led to one of the most uh, sensitive debates of our time, which is the debate uh, between public safety and personal privacy. So to kick off the discussion, guys, I would like to... Uh, just start with a very um, clear-cut question, which is, is uh, our personal privacy at the threat today? Maybe, Scott, you want to start? Well, unfortunately, I'm happy to answer the question directly um, with no, I don't think it's that much under threat. But my caveat is I was trained as a <coughs> And so we look at the asymptotic or long-term state of things. And I think um, it is well within individuals' reach to keep their communications private. So I am a little less concerned about that. All right. What about you, um, Nigel? What's your take on Depends this question? What, Depends what you mean by privacy. Because... <laughs> If it's just about your communications, electronic communications, then everybody has access to strong encryption, whether the governments outlaw it or not, because you just download stuff off the internet, compile it and run it. But you have to be a bit technical savvy, but yeah, you get the idea. So whatever happens, you're always gonna have uh, strong encryption to secure your communications. But actually, the threats to privacy are much, much, much bigger than that. Everybody knows that we have, whenever we go anywhere online, we're tracked, we get adverts pushed to us. These are all um, big in our privacy. You know, I, I, when I go in the car, I'm, I go in the direction I'm going because Google Maps tells me this is the place to go and this is the way to go because they know how many people are on the on the road and this bit's congested because everyone's giving up their privacy to tell Google that this road is congested. So, I mean, and this happens, you know, this, I'm just singling out Google here. I mean, they're all the same. Apple, 
Facebook, every every company is <coughs> collecting data on you, which is basically breaking your privacy. You, you have no privacy now. If you're online, you have no privacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess. I guess there was a lot of uh, meat on the fire already. Um, a, a lot of uh, this, a lot of these questions will be discussed further on in our panel. I also think that the questions that brought up Nigel and Scott are something that everyone is con should be concerned about because at the end of the day we are all using um, we are all using uh, encrypted uh, communication in our everyday life, and uh, as we are going to see in the documentary, <coughs> this, this is one of the biggest revolution uh, that this uh, technology brought us. Uh, but in order to understand this debate fully, we need to go deep into the history of this technology. But before, I want to remind our audience that in any point of the documentary, uh, in any point of the panel, panel discussion, please feel free to write your questions in the chat and uh, uh, we're going to answer those questions. So uh, in, let's, uh, let's maybe show how this technology actually uh, started evolving and how uh, it changed throughout the time. Uh, I'm going to show now a second uh, part of our documentary. The need for cryptographically secure communication dates back to ancient times. Emperor Julius Caesar used cryptographic messages to communicate with his generals. The Caesar cipher was one of the earliest cryptographic systems. In this system, each letter in the message is replaced with another one, which is a certain amount of positions down the alphabet. This certain amount was the key that was needed to decipher each message. If Caesar's enemies retrieved the message without having the key, they would think it was written in some incomprehensible foreign language. You have your uh, word, let's call it cat, and then what you do is you walk along in the alphabet three letters from every existing letter. So if you have the first letter C, then it will encrypt to um, C, D, E, F. So you encrypt C to F. A, you would encrypt to B, C, D, and so on. So that's what the Caesar cipher is. Now what that's doing is actually adding the key three to every letter. There are only 26 letters in the alphabet and therefore only 26 possible keys. That is why today the Caesar cipher is considered among the simplest encryption systems as it is relatively easy to break. Still, in these early times, cryptography was used by governments as a powerful tool for achieving diplomatic and military goals to ensure the security of the state. But the same technology could also be a threat when in the hands of the enemies of the state. One example of this was the conflict between Elizabeth, Queen of England, and Mary, Queen of Scots, in the mid-16th century. Mary, Queen of Scots, was under arrest in England and was plotting with some other Catholics to overthrow and, and assassinate uh, Elizabeth and they were transmitting encrypted um, messages. Mary's cipher was a nomenclator in which both letters and words were replaced by special symbols. Eventually, Elizabeth's spies managed to intercept Mary's correspondence and decipher its content, thus discovering the key. The plot was uncovered and Queen Mary sentenced to death. Fast forward to the 20th century. New breakthroughs in cryptographic techniques made them a key tool in modern warfare. During the Second World War, Nazi Germany deployed the Enigma machine, the most sophisticated encryption device at the time. It consisted of a number of rotors which could encrypt messages by scrambling the 26 letters of the alphabet. The Enigma machine was considered to be unbreakable until British mathematician Alan Turing found a weakness in its implementation. Turing invented the bomb a decryption machine capable of crap. Allowed the Allies to win the Battle of the Atlantic, which allowed America to um, uh, supply the UK with all of the uh, necessary equipment, send all the troops over, and then we have. Okay, <coughs> so we we had uh, three very important examples of uh, <coughs> technology in the past. Of course, I guess there were so many other. Uh, cryptographic uh, inventions that we couldn't uh, include in the documentary, but we thought that those three, Caesar Cipher, Mary's Nomenclator, and the Enigma Machine were the most uh, representative of uh, um, the evolution that this technology had during time. But I would like to know from you guys, 
uh, what do you think of the significance of these uh, three inventions and uh, if uh, you had to include other um, other turning point in the history of cryptography what would you have included maybe uh, scott you would you would like to start oh i was going to defer to nigel for the first one but i'm willing to play the game <coughs> i i just want to inject a comment coming back to the earlier one though that i don't for a minute disagree with nigel's broader previous point that there are many many threats to privacy and it, th those i'm certainly not waving off I was just trying to be responsive to the actual question about peer-to-peer -peer communication. But coming back to the, um, the question at hand, I, I, I think it's difficult to understate the importance of Alan Turing's contribution in a broad way and the Enigma machine in a uh, more focused way. It, uh, it had an enormous uh, impact on shortening uh, the war, comparable to um, any of the key weapons that were developed um, or any of the key uh, battles. So you, you picked a terrific uh, example in that. Mm -hmm. Nigel, what, uh, what do you think of, of this? I, I, would, I, would pick, I would pick a different example. Um, I think Enigma's famous and it gets all the press. Um, uh, Enigma was a battlefield communication well in a wide sense, so it was used to communicate with U-boats, and that helps the back of the Atlantic, and it was used to communicate on the front line. But by far the most important break in the Second World War, in my view, was the breaking of the Lorentz cipher. The Lorentz cipher was used to communicate between the, the high command in Germany and the field commander. So, for example, Rommel would be communicating with uh, Berlin via a Lorentz cipher. The Eastern Front would be communicating with a Lorentz cipher. Now, here... Um, the breaking was done by a guy called Bill Tut, um, who then went off to work in, in Canada um, after the war. And, the, and it was really cool because he broke the cipher without ever seeing the machine. The first time the Allies got a hold of a machine and worked and wondered what it was doing was actually after the war. So without actually having a physical machine to even look at or even a photo of it, he broke the Lorentz cipher. Um, and to automate the breaking, the Lorentz was by orders of magnitude more complicated than the Enigma machine, and it was used for far more secure uh, communications. And to break um, the Lorentz cipher, the uh, British had to invent the di uh, digital computer, which was the Colossus. So the Colossus was used not to break Enigma, it was used to break the Lorentz cipher. And the Lorentz was broken, and the co first Colossus colossi, or plural, I think, uh, came online um, just before D-Day, and they could and they confirmed the fact that the Germans had fallen for the fact for the ruse that uh, Patton was going to invade over the Par de Calais region, and therefore they didn't deploy um, their defences around Normandy when the uh, actual D-Day landings happened, because they thought, thought that was just a ruse and the main event was going to happen elsewhere. And that, and the, the, in terms of cryptographic analysis and the, and for the future of computing, the breaking, the making and breaking of Lorentz is by far the, mo the most interesting story, but often le 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 less in movies than the Enigma machine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was actually surprised to hear that that story was so impactful compared to the one of the Enigma machine, because usually that one, the one of the Enigma machine uh, apparently became more mainstream and they they even made the famous movie in 2014 about it uh but i think what i wants to say something interesting about enigma is so much of the ability to decrypt it came from mistakes that the users of the system made that it would have been more challenging without the fact that users failed to follow the mm -hmm. outline protocols and the reason I point that out is that that is so often where the weakness lies in how people uh, implement or use on a regular basis the encryption protocol. Yeah, you, you don't break encryption. And this may come <clears throat> um, to exactly how law enforcement is going to get access to people's communications. 
you don't break the cryptography, you break the idiots who use it. Yeah, so, <laughs> which in some sense is the story of breaking the Enigma machine. The Enigma machine was broken in the early days of the war by bad operators. There was the operator who always typed in, you had to rekey with three digits every every time, every time you sent a message, and, they, and he always used the same three three letters. And, 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 and Morse code operators could pick up who was typing the Morse, so they knew it was him because... And they break that. The Lorentz cipher was broken without seeing it simply because of an operational mistake. At one point in the war, someone sent the same message twice. They sent it once, and the recipient went, missed that. Can you send it again? And so they sent it again. And then being lazy, they went, oh, I'm not going to cycle that out, out again. I'm going to shorten the words. So they shortened a few words, but with the same meaning. And because they shortened the words a bit, you could kind of like you use it. What we now call differential cryptanalysis to kind of get the, the 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 full key out. So both were broken by bad operator usage, and in some sense, that's how modern crypto work breaks. Because either it's bad crypto, bad implementation. You don't break the crypto; you you break the other stuff, which is easier. Yeah, and actually, that reminds me also of the previous case that we showed in the documentary, which is the the Mary's, uh, Mary's cipher that basically uh, Mary Queen of Scots was uh, plotting against Elizabeth Queen of England but uh, and she was she was using this crypto cryptographic uh, encrypted communication and eventually the spies of Elizabeth managed to um, decipher the, yeah. uh, the the cryptographic techniques that they were using and uh, that's how they basically um, stopped the plot yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the cryptanalysis that was used by Babington, I think his name is, must remember to look that up. I think it's Babington. Um, no, it's not Babington. That's the plot name. Whoever, I can't remember who the, the cryptographer was. I do apologise. Anyway, whoever the head of the British Secret Service at the time, the way they broke it was in some sense exactly the same way that you break the codes that you often see in cornflake packets. You know, you have, it's basically a, a substitution cipher and you basically use statistical analysis. You go, okay, E is the most common letter in English. This is it. The most common two letters together are usually T and H. So if you see two letters together all the time, it's always T and H. And then from that, you can build up a picture of what the key is that's used to transpose uh, the cipher. That's exactly what uh, was done. Mm -hmm. And like, whilst we go to the next bit, I'm going to look up who it was because I'm, I'm very annoyed that I thought it was Babington, which it definitely isn't. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Scott, what do you think uh, uh, could be added to those three examples of brand, uh, groundbreaking cryptographic uh, uh, innovations in history? If you did, we miss something according to you? Well, I just think you need to continue to go forward. I the documentary doesn't talk about Des and uh, differential cryptanalysis that's applied to DES. Um, and it, I think DES is a pretty big step forward. And so um, to me, the intriguing story there is that the creators of DES already knew about differential cryptanalysis and tweaked the parameters to try to be maximally preventative of it. And then to see that uh, the story finally comes out in the public uh, decades later. Indeed, yeah. and it was it was the Babington plot, but the spy was Walsingham. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> okay, we, we got the name. <laughs> got the name right. So, um, je yeah, just to make sure the audience understand, the, um, the these three examples that we put into the documentary uh, are meant to me are meant to explain how the cryptographic technology was in the past just a monopoly of the state, and that. Basically, it was used uh, as, as a weapon until uh, including in World War II, and uh, it was a v very jealously kept secret uh, technology. And uh, states were fighting wars, and uh, in the, it was very important to keep secret this technology in order not to, um, not in order to preserve a national security. And that's why this technology was uh, uh, considered until not long ago as a weapon. Right, and if you're going to go that fast forward, I mean, I know that you have Whit Diffie there, um, but obviously Public Key followed the same story. Um, yeah. Understood um, 
by uh, national governments, the UK in, in that case, well before it was uh, understood publicly. But again, at this point, the, on the public key side, the cat's obviously out of the bag and no going back. In so, yeah, in some sense, the, the key, oh, I don't need to start using the key thing in cryptography, it kind of sounds a bit bad, um, is that, so the story with public key crypto was that it was developed, actually invented in the late 60s, 1970-ish, by um, the British uh, GCHQ. And then um, uh, Diffie and Hellman came up with the idea of public key crypto in their famous paper. And then the first instantiation was uh, was RSA. However, what the interesting thing here is, is that the British didn't exploit public key crypto because they didn't see the application. The real application of public key crypto isn't to communicate between governments and embassies. And that's what the governments were focused on, where they were focused on. We're, we're trying to communicate between two endpoints where we control the endpoints. That's what they were interested in. The real application of public key crypto is one is digital signatures, but more importantly, it's commerce. Because in commerce, you don't control the endpoints yourself. And that is why, in some sense, it took off in the outside world as opposed to the closed world, is because the closed world, they don't want to make money. And in the outside world, they do. <laughs> exactly. And we're going to actually talk about it uh, in, a, in a second. First, I want to just to show that segment that, from the documentary that actually shows that groundbreaking moment uh, uh, of the invention of public key cryptography. So the, the switch between cryptography being a monopoly of the state and uh, cryptography being uh, publicly available. So I'm just going to sh show it now. Everything changed in the mid-1970s when cryptographers Martin Hellman and Whitfield Diffie invented public key cryptography. My name is Whitfield Diffie and I People want to talk to me these days because of some work that I did 47 years ago in the spring of 1975. I am one of the people responsible for the cryptography that makes internet commerce at however secure it is these days. In previous cryptographic systems, an encrypted message could be decrypted thanks to the key, which had to be shared between the sender and the receiver via a secure channel. That exposed the key to the risk of being compromised. Also, for every communication, a new secret key was needed, which means that this system was not scalable. In public key cryptography, both sender and receiver have two types of keys, one public and one private. The public key, which can be publicly distributed, is used to encrypt the message. The private key is kept secret, and it is used to decrypt the message in combination with the public key. By bypassing the need of sharing a secret key, Public key cryptography solved cryptography scalability issue. For the first time in history, an unlimited amount of people could communicate in a private manner. I was trying to have a totally secure North American telephone system. So you'd have 100 million telephones, say, and anybody should be able to pick up any one of them and call any other one of them, and nobody would be able to listen in. Now that I've gotten on the internet, I'd rather be on my computer than doing just about anything. It's really cool. Public key cryptography wouldn't have been so groundbreaking if it wasn't for the advent of computers and the internet. These technologies enabled public encrypted communication on a global scale. Cryptography itself became a foundational element of how the internet works. From e-commerce to emails, all sorts of private data exchange on the internet is now possible thanks to public key cryptography. Since the internet comes along, everybody's got a computer. Everybody's linking to everybody, everything. Everybody's got a mobile phone. We're carrying around cryptography in our pockets, in our bank cards, in our mobile phones, in every single device we have. There's cryptography everywhere. I saw this as a way to advance liberty and create a new, richer range of interactions between Okay, so there was a, a lot going on in this uh, in this segment. So um, this is basically the groundbreaking moment uh, for cryptographic te for cryptographic technology in the 20th century, the invention of uh, uh, public key cryptography. But first, I would like to know from Scott, what do you think is the 
significance of the inv of this invention? How important was it? Well, again, it's a huge uh, breakthrough, but I really like the point Nigel made in the previous comment. It's not just about keeping communication private. It's authenticating. It's the signing. And I think that's really a key point in the sense that I think we're seeing a, a uh, transformation where cryptography initially was just about keeping secrets. But now we're seeing a flourishing of all sorts of other use cases where it goes well beyond keeping a secret. It's, it's knowing who you're talking with. It's, it's validating that. It's knowing that the document that you're looking at uh, hasn't been changed uh, since. It's um, being able to do uh, operations between disparate parties that have never met each other, but can have create trust amongst each other. Um, so it's becoming so much more than just a privacy preserver. I, I, I'd, I'd reiterate that. So I have this really good uh, example that I give students. So, okay, the reason why I care about who I'm communicating is as follows. I don't actually care that my credit card details are encrypted, okay, when I buy something online. Because if I, if I encrypt them, that's not the important bit. Because if I encrypt them to the mafia or the bad guys, I might as well not encrypt them at all, okay, because I'm just sending them to the bad guys. What's really important is that I'm encrypting, encrypting them to the shop and the shop online shop is identified to me as being the online shop. So it's nothing to do with the encryption. You know, if I just send you my credit card details, the, there's so much stuff going on the internet, the probability that you intercept the, my, my, in the plain text, you intercept it, get my credit card details, and then use my credit card is actually quite low. In fact, it's easier for you to get my credit card details by other means, <laughs> okay? <laughs> The really interesting bit is that when I do set, I am sending credit card details, I care that it goes to the intended recipient. So it's far more important who I talk to than, than the fact that the communication is private. Yeah, actually, yeah, actually that's, that's, that's a very that's great, a great point, point, I think, because uh, I think that uh, a lot of people don't really, um, don't really think about cryptography as something that actually um, is not only cryptography is not only about privacy it's also about establishing some sort of trust between people communicating with each other and that's pretty much the um, the philosophy that stands uh, that's that is like at the at the basis of blockchain technology at the end of the day which is uh, you Scott uh, know better than anyone else uh, you told me that basically you uh, were obsessed with this idea of uh, making uh, uh, digital documents uh, um, kind of um, pub, um, secured in, term, in, in the sense that pub, digital documents that cannot be altered. And so that's, that's how you, you invented the blockchain. You started with this idea that you wanted to make uh, digital data impossible to, to alter. And the cryptography is also useful for, for that, uh, if I well understood. Right, for creating an immutable record. Um, the only thing I would disagree with what you just stated is you said I would know better than anyone else. And the beautiful thing about invention is other people build on top of what you do. And so it, it's nice, as Whit Diffie pointed out in his uh, talk, you know, he said it's nice that people are talking about something. In his case, he said I did 47 years ago. It's nice that people are talking about something that Stuart and I did uh, you know, 25, 30 years ago, but um, it's an exploding and exciting field. And it's really about contributions that we can make in the here and now. So we don't, we, we may claim priority, but we don't claim superiority of, of thought about it. Uh, it's a free for all and the best idea wins. Right, and but I still want to. I mean, uh, we appreciate uh, your being so modest, uh, Scott. But also, I want to bring uh, the attention of our audience on the fact that we have on the co-inventor of blockchain. So, if anyone is curious about uh, knowing more about how Scott got, got to this, uh, contributed contributed to this great technology, please write your questions in the chat. Also, if you have any other questions regarding the history, the evolution of cryptographic te technology, we have uh, an expert 
of history of cryptography nigel so he will be able to answer any questions so please don't be shy and write your questions in the chat so uh, i want just to follow on follow follow up on something that we we, just, we were just discussing before so um, the um, this paper that was published by Diffie in the mid 70s um how how groundbreaking was that as far as i know that was the first paper published on cryptography right nigel uh well no well mm, it depends <laughs> it's the it was the first academic work probably there were other work papers on cryptography and there were books on cryptography so if you can go back there's some ancient things due to uh go back to the people who were in the um uh u.s intelligence in the first world war published a few books on on cryptography and stuff like that um there's a really good book by Carl, um the code breakers which goes to the ancient history what's cool okay so so what was diffie's paper so diffie's paper was interesting because it was the first probably the first or certainly the first famous um, it's easier to clarify it. Uh, first academic paper, which talked about something new, as opposed to reporting about something old, which is what all the previous stuff had been. So this was the first thing that proposed something new. And the something new was interesting. Now, what's very cool about the original Diffie and Helmer paper is that basically anyone can read it. It's got virtually no maths in it. It's all from all virtually no maths. It has some, but it has virtually no maths in it. it. Has virtually no cryptography in it. It's kind of a thought experiment. It basically says, "Wouldn't it be cool if we could do cryptography where we didn't have to have a key at either end?" And then it kind of goes all the things you could do with that. It says you could have digital signatures. You could have this. You could have that. Da, 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 and you could enable this, and you could enable that. So it's kind of like a thought experiment. And then it actually doesn't really say how to come up with cryptography. <laughs> it actually gives no concrete instantiation of how you could actually implement this. It gives the Diffie-Hellman protocol as an example, but they kind of saw the Diffie-Hellman protocol as not not an encryption scheme. Now we kind of think the Diffie-Hellman protocol is kind of the core basis. But in those days, they thought key agreement was different from actual encryption. There's a kind of um mainly because they didn't have an internet where everyone's connected all the time so the diffie helmet protocol in the 1970s is really meaningless um mm -hmm. uh but so they had these kind of it's a really very good paper to read because it has so many cool things in it ideas thought experiments wouldn't it be cool if you did this wouldn't it be cool if we had that couldn't we do this but the actual instantiation of a true public key encryption scheme didn't happen until about a year or two later mm -hmm. and i think yeah. there the key transition you know you're asking how seminal a moment it is and I, I i certainly agree with what nigel said the other thing is you know just shortly after that you start to see the rise of cryptography that says if this mathematical problem is hard then this system has a certain level of security Mm -hmm. And that's really the, the point where you're starting to ground something in more than just um, obscurity. Um, now, obviously, those foundations themselves um, are in large respect yet to be proved, but at least it allows us to build something on a foundation of identifiable assumptions. And that, to me, is also a major breakthrough. Yeah, I think I think there. I think this is this goes a little a little later. So this was like late seventies, early eighties, and you see this groundbreaking series of papers by Goldwasser, McCallie, Rivest, and others, where they actually define what it means for something to be secure. Uh, it's kind of interesting that we had two thousand years of cryptography and no one knew what security meant. Right. And so, so to give you an idea, so this is again standard thing you can tell students. Okay, what does it mean to break a cipher? And so the first thing they go is, uh, get the key. Well, yeah, okay, breaking the key breaks the cipher. In some sense, that's what happened with Enigma. You got the key. That's what happens with the Caesar cipher. You get the key, you get everything. Okay, so that's fine. But there could be other ways of breaking the cipher. What happens if you just wanted to decrypt that message? Maybe getting the message is breaking the cipher. Is that the definition of breaking the cipher? It could be. 
But then you kind of think of other things as you think about, well, I might not actually care about the message. What I might care about is information about the message. So for example, if the message leaked, if it was a, if it was a stock market example, and I either send a buy order or I send a sell order in, all you really need to know is whether it's buy or sell. You don't care whether I say sell, get rid of, dispose, um, put up for sale or whatever. You care about the meaning of the message. And that's also a breaking of the security of the encryption scheme. So you can kind of see we've gone from this total break of you get the key to a break of you find some fuzzy information that you can't really quite define about the message, but which you shouldn't be able to get. And it was quantifying that kind of, that last thing, which sounds a bit fuzzy, you can actually quantify it scientifically. It was the great contribution of the late 70s, early 80s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also I want to remind our audience that, of course, the history of cryptography is, is extremely complex and uh, uh, we try to select the, uh, what we thought were the main uh, turning points. But of course, there are so many more uh, elements to add to it. And that's why we are here with our guests to, to expand a little bit on that. But I also I would like to ask you now a question regarding the role of the internet in that. Because as you mentioned before, without the internet, this public key cryptography invention would have been mm, probably much less uh, effective and, and significant. Uh, right, Scott? Yeah, I totally agree. And something that I often say is that, in a sense, there's a broader wave of technological disruption, disruption that in, encompasses all of the cryptographic innovations. And that is twofold. One, as we become, as it becomes easier and easier to communicate between any one person and any other person. And two, as the amount of computation power computational power that we have to mediate those interactions. Those to me are the two great waves, the increase in connectivity and the increase in computational power to mediate communication. That I think is where all of the flourishing of new cryptographic innovation uh, sort of rides on. Because as you say, until there was, you know, essentially, you know, what I would call in squared connectivity needs, as opposed to just one nation state to another, and the need for, um, you know, the number of keys growing linearly with the population rather than as the square of the population, you know, public key cryptography really didn't have a, a role to play that would be nearly as explosive. And so in that sense, it's the same point I'm making. It's as connectivity has increased and computing power to mediate the connectivity has increased. That's what's leading to the flourishing of um, the, the flourishing of applications for existing methods, and it drives the creativity for coming up with um, the ability to solve new kinds of problems that go well, well beyond just a secure communication or privacy. And the interesting thing there is that. Um, uh, so if you look back at the early 90s, um, so there was an internet. There was, there was been a, there's been an internet from the 70s, right? But the ARPANET's like ancient. So and universities were connected by the internet and so were governments and so were research agencies. So there was always an internet. There was always email. Um, and then we kind of got this World Wide Web, which the first time I saw it, I just went, oh, this is like Gopher, but with images. What's so impressive of that for those of the old enough to remember what Gopher was? Um, but uh, the real key difference is, is that someone had the idea to put commerce on the internet. The whole point of the internet up to the early 1990s, the mid 1990s in some sense, was you were communicating with people you trusted. There were no bad guys. It was just a bunch of universities, a bunch of governments, and you were communicating with people you knew via email. And it was kind of had the kind of security we have for email now, i.e. none. Um, and it was only when someone went, let's put commerce on the internet, that suddenly you see this flourishing of cryptography. And you suddenly see this flourishing, not flourishing of cryptography, but flourishing of deployment of cryptography. Now, kind of what's interesting is, is that I know someone who was kind of there at the early stages at that point, and he was in a meeting and he went, and, and, and there were a bunch of these, what he calls upstart, young upstarts going, 
um, let's put some cryptography on the internet because we want to sell stuff. And his response was, but you're not allowed to sell stuff on the internet. Because in those days, it was <laughs> the internet wasn't, you weren't allowed to do commerce on the internet. So imagine a, a, a world in which everyone thinks the internet, that's, no, 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 no. We're not getting that grubby with commerce, you see. It's kind of a very different planet then than it is now. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Actually, I would like to, know to show to the audience uh, this segment related to, to the 90s, which is about uh, actually the usage of cryptography for, um, for, for commerce. So basically, as you said, the uh, financial interest of companies pushed for the public usage of cryptography in a way. So I'm going to show you now the segment. In the late 80s, a group of cryptographers, engineers, and privacy advocates called cypherpunks started opposing government's attempts to limit cryptography. This confrontation became known as the Crypto Wars. Cypherpunks believes cryptography was an instrument for citizens to achieve individual privacy and protect themselves from government surveillance. One of the cypherpunks, Professor Adam Back, started writing cryptographic code on t-shirts as a way to protest against the cryptography export ban. And so there were t-shirts, there were tattoos, people were using it to, uh, as a signature, you know, at the bottom of their email, saying, oh, this is not exportable. But of course, they're exporting it while they do it. Towards the end of the 90s, most restrictions on the usage of strong cryptography were eventually removed. This was the result of the common pressure from privacy advocates and businesses whose interests were harmed by the restrictions. Right, so now we got pretty much at the core of our, of our, of our discussion, which is the attempts by the government to actually recapture the control of cryptography after public key cryptography was uh, invented and it became widely spread uh, through the internet. The government started trying to control it. So in the 90s, there, was the, there were the cypherpunks who opposed this tendency. He, they were opposing uh, restrictions being imposed on cryptography. And now I would like to know, Scott, uh, you were uh, one of the cypherpunks in the sense that you were, um, you were in the list of the cypherpunks, this mailing list, this famous mailing list where cypherpunks were exchanging communication uh, about these ideas. So what, what was the feeling of being included in that uh, list at the time? And let me just say that it's that I was inspired and motivated by people like Tim May and David Chong, who were saying we need to um, we need to let liberty flourish by using cryptography to, in a sense, level the playing field and remove from uh, strong, trusted central authorities and their um, position of uh, position of asymmetric power into a, a leveled playing field where um, individuals had more ability to uh, control their information. So I was very much part of that, um, though I would hasten to add that for me it was the crypto libertarian notion rather than the outright crypto anarchist uh, <laughs> flavor. I would I would kind of add a little caveat to your uh, your uh, your video. In, the, in some sense, there were the cypherpunks, and there were all these people trying to get PG. You know, there's the famous case of uh, the, the PGP thing being printed and sent around, etc. And there was a lot of effort. But in some sense, the reason the first crypto wars were won is money. Mm -hmm. Is people started making a lot of money on the internet. And to protect people on the internet, you had to have encryption. And it, that was the reason. You couldn't have a, a, a major economy trying to export computers or browsers or other pieces of software that had to connect with other computers around the planet and that would be in the, in the crypto software in there had to be nobbled and made insecure and you still wanted to protect your economy. You, you wanted to protect your economy. You want to protect the investment that your companies have made in the new technology. You want to pr protect the big, new, super duper mega corporations. In those days, all of the mega corporations we know now didn't really exist. The, apart from Apple existed, but the Facebooks, the Googles, et cetera, and the Amazons didn't exist in those days. But you could see that they were being going to be developed. 
you know, that was in the 90s, people talk about delivering movies on demand. You know, everyone thought that was mad. And now we have Netflix, etc. cetera. You know? like this, is, this was considered mad, but the things had to be put in place to enable that. And if you imagine, no Hollywood studio is going to put a movie on the internet unless you can protect it. You know, this is clearly the, it was commerce that won the crypto wars. It's a nice story with all the cypherpunks and everything, but in my view, money talks, money won. That was that, and that's that's, and now we're here with all of all of the internet as we have it. Yeah, that's actually a great point. I want I wanted to actually ask you if you consider the the cypherpunk as the main the main actors behind these uh, changes, but yeah, uh, I guess that the cypherpunks were more like the the drivers of this narrative, these kind of romantic ideas, beside, be, but behind these romantic ideas, uh, as often happens in history, there were like economical, economic interests. Scott, mm -hmm. what, what do you think about it? I think it takes both. Um, you need the inspiration and then you need the economic incentives. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite uh, inversions that supports the economic incentives notion is the struggle, if you will, between Bitcoin and uh, fiat securities. I know that's getting a little ahead of ourselves, but I think ultimately the interests of the nation state for their economies to thrive is going to require them to allow cryptocurrencies to thrive. And maybe that's a little ahead of it, but to me it echoes Nigel's point about commerce drives things incentives matter and eventually people come around to a new sort of reality driven by economic growth yeah actually what you what you said is actually not that had on our on ourselves we had just a, um, an interview not long ago where we were discussing this issue about uh, what was what is the economic incentive for uh, for governments to ban bitcoin or to impose heavy restrictions on bitcoin and uh, I, I, I kind of agree that uh, the government might not have the uh, economic incentive to, to impose those restrictions because businesses might do the same as they did in the 90s with the, with the restrictions on, 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 on encryption. They might uh, have an economical incentive to prevent uh, heavy, heavy regulation of Bitcoin to take place. But that, of course, that's just a, a speculation so far at the moment. Um, but now I would like to move forward uh, in the discussion because that war, the, the first crypto wars were won, as you, as you also underlined. But uh, now we are in the middle of a new crypto war, the, the so-called crypto war 2.0. And I want to um, show our audience what we're talking about. Indeed, concerns over privacy issues exploded into the global spotlight in recent years. In 2013, CIA employee Edward Snowden revealed the existence of a mass surveillance program run by the U.S. National Security Agency. Millions of U.S. citizens' telephone calls were recorded and gathered in large databases. There were suspicious people who thought something like that could be happening, but it was actually much worse than the average person expected. Snowden's revelation sparked a renewed demand for privacy-focused technology tech companies started implementing end-to-end -end encryption in their messaging services and mobile devices. In end-to-end -end encrypted communication, content is accessible only by the parties involved. Not even the service provider can access it. As the main providers of public encryption, tech companies quickly ended up at the center of government scrutiny. In 2016, the FBI asked Apple to create a special software or a backdoor into its products. This would enable them to break into an encrypted phone belonging to the shooter who killed 14 people in San Bernardino the year earlier. On that occasion, Apple declined to comply with the authorities' request. Such a backdoor into strong encryption would allow law enforcement to access users' private data upon the issuance of a warrant. But security analysts agree that once an access method is created, the security of the whole encryption system would be compromised. Okay, so before we get into this matter, I would like to, I wanted to ask you, Na Nigel, are you, do you have like a, had um, the hard deadline, uh, or you have some additional time for the discussion? I have an extra five minutes after the hour, so that's fine. <laughs> so okay, so you have some more time. 
Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So um, we have uh, uh, we have now a new uh, renovated confrontation between the privacy advocates and the governments because now the government uh, didn't is not trying anymore to uh, limit the di distribution of um, of cryptographic technology. They but but they wanna uh, have a privileged access uh, to it in case they find it necessary. So. What do you think? Uh, um, what, do, what do you think, Nigel? This idea of a backdoor. Why? Why is it bad? Okay, so there's two. There's two things here. One, let's pick apart. One, governments. It's not governments. It's specific parts of government, and it's generally it's law enforcement, which isn't the people interested in securing the uh, the economy. It isn't the people interested in securing the state. So it's generally, it's not the security services asking for this. It's not people interested in commerce. It's specifically law enforcement, which is has a particular problem in that it's under-resourced and under-teched. It's trying to it's trying to do old-fashioned policing, and it's been shown this huge amount of data that's willing around there, and it wants access to it. It's a bit like it wants everybody to be fingerprinted. It wants everybody to be iris scanned. It wants everybody to do face recognition. Because you know what? It's cheaper to put a phone, a, a camera up on the street and take uh, pictures of everybody's face than it is to put a policeman there. Okay? So it's cheaper. It's just it's law enforcement. So it's not necessarily governments per se. It's a specific part of government that has other problems. Okay. Then we have, they want to put a back door in. Now, the problem with the back door is what do you mean by a back door? Now, I've got a house. I've got a front door and I've got a back door. My front door has a lock on it and my back door has a lock on it. Okay. Both have a key. And I've got two keys, one for the front door, one for the back door. If I give the police the back door key, I lose security. Now, there's a really good example of this. Um, I'm English, I come from England. In the 1970s in England, apparently, I've been told this, not, a, maybe a apocryphal story may not be true, but it's sort of a good story. There used to be an um, advertising campaign on television to say, tell the police when you're going on holiday, and then they'll look after your house. And everybody who told the police that they were going on holiday was far more likely to be robbed because there are some bad policemen. Okay? And so, you know, if I gave my back door key, to the police for my house on the off chance that they might have to come in because I've had a heart attack and, and that they need to get in to take me to hospital or something like that. The risk of giving the back door key to the police and then it being copied and being used for other things, my house being burgled, um, all sorts of other things, me being spied on by the government if I'm in a state where um, this is a problem, that would increase. So it doesn't increase anyone's security and it's lazy policing. Okay. Mm -hmm. The other point is, is if I have a back, if now you go, okay, so the government's sort of law enforcement agencies go, I've got a back door. I want to put a back door in. I'm going to mandate that everyone in the USA has a, has a key to their house that they're going, the back door is going to be given to the government. But that technology is not a house that's just in the US. That's a house everywhere on the planet. So who gets the back door key for every house on the planet? Is it the American government? In which case, I can tell you the Chinese are going to complain. The Russians are going to complain. The Europeans are going to complain. Everyone's going to complain that everyone's house has got a back door key that's given to the US government. Or is it that this key, we give the same one copy to the US government and we give another copy to the Russian government, another copy to the Chinese government, another copy to the American, uh, German government or whatever. But then everybody is free for all. You know, we can have the Chinese can break into Russian houses. The Germans can break into American houses. Today we had that the US were listening into Angela Merkel's phone calls because the Danish had helped them get in. Yeah. I mean, none of these people are trustworthy. So it's it's lazy. It's not needed. It reduces the security of the person in the house. And once you have it, it breaks everything and it breaks the security of everybody. And you can't control it. You can't control whether it's for your country or for every country. Are all governments good? Are all governments bad? Who knows? Who, everyone's got a different opinion on what they think is good governments and bad governments. But 
You can't trust everybody. If you didn't, if you could trust everybody, you wouldn't have any locks on the door in the first place. Those were all good points. But Scott, what is your take on this on this issue about the back doors? Well, it's just it's not feasible, and it's not feasible not just um, for technical reasons and not just for the reasons that Nigel just cited, which are valid. It, it's not feasible in in the sense that you want your companies to be able to compete on a global stage. Okay? And if you insist that your companies, companies domiciled uh, where you are, have to be crippled, well, people are simply going to choose alternatives. And so to the point about uh, economic incentives ultimately drive this, um, I think the resolution is that the government at large learns that it just it can't compete uh, economically. Its its economy can't compete economically on the global stage with allow, uh, without allowing the maximal kind of protection that individual consumers in whatever country they are 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 going to uh, are going to insist on. Mm -hmm. That's not it's again it's the money talks always right and also we saw that in the case of san bernardino the fbi eventually managed to break into that phone without actually apple collaborating with them and creating this uh this, this special access so it seems that it seems that the law enforcement eventually can uh, get the information they want despite the uh, the absence of, of I mean any... they need to be told up with the correct technology and the correct expertise they need to so they need to there's a the problem is this is there's a, a worldwide source of security experts and do you know what if you're a cyber security expert law enforcement is way down your list of career choices <laughs> you know you'd go I want to earn millions in the in the tech sector. I want to earn not so much millions, but a few bits in the tech sector. I might then want to work in the government in the in the in the security services because that's kind of cool, and I'll see cool stuff. And then underneath that, we've got law enforcement. And I think so. Law enforcement is not got the ability to recruit the experts that could allow it to have access, which isn't by breaking the crypto, but it's with other means. And there are various other ways of breaking the crypto of breaking the crypto, breaking the communication for what for when you really want it, that go back that we've already talked um, in the last hour on bad uses, bad things that users do, um, utilizing exploits, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, so there are ways in, but giving a backdoor is lazy and counterproductive and economically harmful to the state that in that suggests it. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I would like just to show you the last um, the last segment of the documentary to, and then we're going to have a couple of more uh, remarks and uh, uh, we're going to wrap up the discussion around this uh, final debate between what should be privileged, public safety uh, or personal privacy, or is it like a false, uh, a false uh, dichotomy? Let's, uh, let's go with the last... What if people's lives are put at risk because of impenetrable encryption? In a hostage situation, in a kidnap situation, in a trafficking situation, in a terrorist situation, uh, the potential loss of life in a situation of the type I've described could be attributable to these companies' encryption. Uh, yes, I, I, absolutely. There if indeed, as a result of Apple's encryption of a device, someone dies are you willing to accept liability for that death senator as a software engineer my focus is on trying to provide the strongest security for all of our users and protect them in all cases proponents of a backdoor into encryption point out that individual privacy is not an absolute right and that in certain cases limiting this right is necessary to protect society as a whole if the choice is between a world where we can achieve a 99% assurance against cyber threats for the typical consumer while still providing law enforcement 80% of the access it needs to protect society, or a world where we have boosted our cybersecurity to 99.5%, 
but at a cost of reducing law enforcement's access to zero, the choice for society should be clear. However, many believe that giving government access to popular encrypted messaging services would not achieve the intended purpose of preventing crime. It would just cause bad actors to switch to other encrypted tools, which are nowadays widely accessible. So all you've done is put a backdoor in for legitimate users, and you've actually made it worse for yourself because now you don't know what system the criminals are using because they've gone off and developed their own because this is easy. Right. So I think that a lot of these points where you already covered them previously, but to me, it's pretty interesting to know uh, what your opinion about this fundamental kind of philosophical uh, debate, which is, uh, is personal privacy an absolute right? And shouldn't it be, uh, shouldn't it be kind of uh, put aside when the um, when the public when the public safety is at risk? So yeah. maybe we maybe maybe Nigel could start. Yeah, we have this. So it'd be, um, if you, it, but the San Bernardino case, they got access to the phone eventually, but they did it in a targeted way using special tools. They didn't have a backdoor that gets them into everything. Now, this, the, the percentages were quite a good argument. If you only have, if you have a system that's 90% secure for consumers, 10% is a bloody big number, given how many trillions of dollars are used. So you actually, and if you deliberately weaken it to allow the law enforcement 80% access, your actual act security for consumers is 0%. Okay, so if so, you have zero percent security for consumers, zero percent security for companies, zero percent security for commerce, and actually, it's easier to commit crime. It's much not only does is is the world gone dark for the law enforcement, but actually, we can now but now criminals can target everybody. They know exactly what's going on. They can break into everybody's communication, and they can find out you're on holiday. You don't need to tell the police. Then to have to have a bent copper going knock. knock uh, burgling your house because you're on holiday and you've just sent a message on whatsapp going hey it's really nice here in on the beach and you just broadcast this to the world the criminals go oh yeah okay yeah yeah okay he's he's, he's on the beach let's go rob his house you know you haven't got any security you've you've got cases where you could access politicians politicians regularly use whatsapp you know all of that would be public that actually might be quite good in fact, there's quite an interesting case in that um, there was a, a, a proposal in France that they wanted to remove legitimate access to end-to-end -end encryption for the populace, but allow it only for politicians. Mm. Now, in my view, it should be the other way around. Actually, politicians should have all their communications unencrypted because, quite frankly, they're corrupt. So that would be... My, my solution is that actually if the politicians really want uh, unencrypted communications, they should be the first ones to try it out. And then let's see what happens then. And I suspect within a few months, we'll have end-to-end -end encryption for everybody. Yeah, actually, that reminds me of something that Scott told me in the interview when he said that at the end of the day, the rights of the state should become... should should come later compared to the, um, the rights of the individual. So the state uh, should, um, the individual shouldn't give up their rights for, for, the sake, uh, for the sake of the state. But I guess that it's also, as you said, Nigel, it's also a matter of, uh, I mean, according to you, there is a lack of actual knowledge, actu an actual lack of uh, knowledge about how these things works among the people that are advocating for these laws. Because, as you said, uh, they wouldn't, according to you, they wouldn't work. So, mm -hmm. Scott, uh, what, what's, your, what's, what's your take uh, on this? Well, I would pick up a little bit of a thread that Nigel started. And I have long argued that the fu more fundamental issue is information asymmetry. Namely, um, if, uh, if, if you don't like the government having a you know, camera on every street corner, um, why not worry about... Um, having a camera on everyone that's watching the cameras on the street corner. In other words, <laughs> I, I'd be willing to take odds if uh, if there wasn't an information asymmetry. If we all got to see what 
everyone in the government was doing, then, uh, you know, I, I could uh, go for liberalizing uh, the opportunities. I also just don't want the moment to pass without noting that these arguments that would you be willing to stand, you know, to be liable for one death, these, these are arguments that shouldn't even be given any serious credibility. I mean, people, people would make arguments like that that says, okay, well then therefore torture is okay because if there's one person whose life can be saved because we can now torture everybody, you, you have to take stands and governments have to adapt. I pointed out once one of obviously I understand that law enforcement is concerned about uh, getting their job done, but the world will not come to an end when there's end to end encryption. And my favorite example of this about how technology just requires governments to adapt and they still go on existing is there was a time when mechanical clocks were first introduced that there was an Asian government that banned individuals from owning mechanical clocks. Only the government could have mechanical clocks. Why? Because they feared that if people had clocks, they could coordinate uprisings and rebellions against the government. Now, how many governments today worry about whether people have wristwatches? None. <laughs> and, and, the, and the point is, it was something that was considered a legitimate fear at the time. And yet, in hindsight, it seems absurd that people were overly concerned about it. And I think for many of these technological uh, innovations that seem to force uh, issues with the government, quite frankly, the government is going to learn to adapt and they're going to do just fine as they understand that their role is changing. And they just need to find some more value-creating roles for themselves. Awesome. Okay, I think that uh, we are ready to wrap things up. Uh, Nigel, do you have any more, any final comments to make? Because I think that no, our audience... I'm, 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 I'm done with comments. You've had me. <laughs> Sucked me dry. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I, I just just as a final remark, of course, I would have liked a representative of the other side to be in the documentary, uh, maybe someone from uh, law enforcement or from uh, uh, people that advocate for this kind of uh, restriction to be put in place. But unfortunately, no one uh, agreed to talk to us. So, um, uh, so we just uh, reported the uh, official statements that were made regarding this issue from uh, uh, as you as you saw in the documentary from different lawmakers, so uh, now people that uh, look at the at, at this uh, live stream should make their 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 opinion, should make their mind up about what they think about this uh, uh, very crucial debate. And I hope that this guest, that our guest, gave them a lot of uh, um, information to reflect about. So thank you a lot, guys, to come on the, on our show with us and also to be part of our documentary. Uh, thanks for the chance to participate. And again, I hope it's been beneficial to others. But for me, simply having the chance to talk about these issues is always insightful for me. I always come away with something new to think about. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So thank you for watching. I'm Giovanni. And